Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here. Last time I was here, I was um, part of the entertainment for a, a fundraiser for the Oregon Initiative. So, you know, some mixed emotions, in a sense, coming back, uh, you know, losing Cherie and, and, and so on. But uh, delighted uh, still to the way things went and, and uh, exciting times ahead. I'm going to do something a little bit unexpected with this talk and focus on risks. And uh, <laughs> this, isn't, uh, this isn't Oregon. It's next door where I now live in, in uh, California, not far from Oakland. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I wonder, you know, if, which, uh, how you'd question whether you'd question the marketing here and perhaps who the target demographic would be with marketing like this. For me, it, it doesn't really smack of uh, sacred plant medicine so much as something else. So when we look at risks, there's a few ways we can do it. A classic thing, we can look at averaging, but another way to, to look at risks is to, in a sense, look at the negative outliers and their prevalence, and then try and understand why they happen. So this extreme value analysis um, is an interesting uh, approach that might be worth checking out. Extreme events that are rare, but they're important. And I think it's important that we try to understand them because if we, you know, we've got to try and mitigate the chances of such events happening. Um, uh, and we know that n not everyone is such a fan of psychedelics generally and, and psychedelic therapy, so there'll be people sniping at such events. And in my view, it's best that science tries to address these things rather than, for example, a journalistic uh, approach. This is a horrible slide, I know, uh, but it, there is a, a kind of message um, to it, which is just in a sense to compare an averaging approach to an extreme value um, approach. And so, you know, we can look at ketamine. A lot of excitement has uh, arisen around ketamine as a rapid antidepressant and a rapid agent for reducing suicidality. However, we could look at suicidal acts, and of course they matter because they could translate into a successful suicide attempt. And when that was done in this meta-analysis, you won't be able to see, unfortunately, but some of the acts with ketamine were actually uh, higher. Uh, we should put that in a context, and I do that with a little box at the bottom which shows you from meta-analyses of antidepressant trials the kind of rates that you would expect with antidepressants uh, for attempts around 6 to 7 percent. Um, with antidepressants or placebo, that those are attempts. Remember, we're dealing with such a risky population here, people who are, in a sense, primed for... Uh, for suicidal behavior, so that needs to be taken into account. And then suicidal acts around 0.5 to 0.8%. Um, so actually the rates in this ketamine trial, even though they were higher with ketamine than the, than the control, double in some cases, um, they're still lower than that average uh, from other trials. And I also show that with classic psychedelics, we don't really know the extreme value data yet. Uh, those rare events from the trials because there's not enough data. But I've, this, in a sense, what I want to do with this talk is sort of suggest a few things. Take it or leave it, but there may be some things that we could look at when we look at risk. Yes, if we look at the averaging suicidality, for example, we see interesting and impressive drops with psychedelic therapy. So in this talk, what I'll work towards, I know I don't have long, but I'll work towards... Um, uh, in a sense, a proposed solution to the problem. A problem is risks and adverse events, and the solution is modeling so that we can predict their occurrence. And if we can do that, we can ideally mitigate the risk. And in a sense, what I'll conclude in onto, I'm going to show you now, um, some of the predictors are the classic set, setting and matrix. I'm very lucky to you know, have my position in honor of Ralph Metzner, who... Uh, coined the term set and setting um, and, and metrics from Betty Eisner. The, the broader setting, if you want, is another really important component there. So we have that data to support that. 
I'd love to do a controlled study to, to test it more systematically, but we do have naturalistic observational data supporting its importance. Therapeutic Alliance as well, a wonderful colleague of ours, Roberta Murphy at Imperial, led on that uh, nice paper that's now published. In red are the published things. A lot of green there. These are all unpublished things that I'm going to show you now. Um, prior psychological vulnerabilities and a special risk with personality disorder if you take that negative uh, value analysis approach. Um, absorption, trait absorption, young age, and high or unknown drug quantities, and also unpleasant acute experiences as predictors. So what we did, because it's so easy to, in a sense, not point the telescope at risk, uh, we did, you know, we did, in a sense, just that. We pointed the telescope at risk and we set up a survey that invited people who felt that they'd had a prolonged negative psychological response to a psychedelic to first of all fill out some questionnaires and then we did um, quite detailed interviews with them. We, uh, just for the, in the, the expediency of a student's project, which is what this was, uh, we interviewed 15 people. In a sense, consider this a proof of principle. It's just a way of doing um, this kind of um, approach. So we could have done a much bigger study, but it was expediency that meant it was 15. And uh, interviewed by the team that you can see here. And what came out were uh, scenarios associated with these uh, apparent um, uh, quite, quite significant adverse psychological responses. And yes, it's things that we knew anyway in a sense, but it was still an important exercise. Unsafe or complex environments uh, during and surrounding the experience, unpleasant acute experiences, particularly with classics. We also asked about MDMA, so there were some exceptions with MDMA that weren't really so much about, say, a bad trip, so to speak, or a challenging experience. Prior psychological vulnerabilities came through higher unknown drug quantities in young age. Um, so. It was worth doing, in a sense, to discover that there were no surprises. I mean, there was a sense that we don't really know. You hear of anecdotes of, say, you know, apparent prolonged uh, psychotic responses to psychedelics. But unless you point the telescope, you know, you're not really going to know anything with any detail. It's still hard to know about causality. So, in a sense, what I said to the team here was, like, behave like detectives. Look at these cases. And in any of these cases, w did you have a healthy person taking a psychedelic for the first time who developed schizophrenia, for example? Or were there complex you know, circumstances that contributed to these cases? And what we found is just that. There wasn't really any exceptions to that rule of, say, a prolonged psychotic response happening. Um, uh, without some risk factors that could be identified. So it was worth doing. As I said, this um, extreme value analysis is another way of looking at the data, looking at extreme values, and, and that's sort of what we did with that qualitative approach there. But here we do it with a more quantitative approach. We um, threshold based on a generic index of mental health and look at people who, in our relatively big sample, pooling data from three prospective studies, uh, did the worst. It showed the worst changes in their well-being, and then we focused on those and looked at predictors. Um, so these are people whose well-being drops by at least three points um, after uh, four weeks after a psychedelic experience. And I must emphasize that the way we do our naturalistic observational research is to do prospective research, and I would encourage others to do the same. You do before and after. You don't fall into that retrospective bias of only looking at after the event where you can't really infer on causality. So when we did this, what, one thing that we did around prediction of these bottom margin cases, these worst case, you know, negative outliers, was to look at prior psychiatric diagnoses. And we segregated it by diagnostic categories. And what we found was that there was one diagnostic category that when entered into the logist logistical regression model actually predicted the occurrence of falling into the bottom margin, the negative outliers, by a, a fourfold magnitude. So entering the, the other, you know, uh, covariates, um, that was the elevated risk of being into that bottom margin. And it was only significant for personality disorder. We weren't specific, unfortunately, about the different types, so it was generic personality disorder. You can see it was a small sample size 
of those who had personality disorder, it was only 16, but five of those uh, fell into this bottom margin, and that was an elevated uh, rate. You can see them dropping there. The picture is more interesting when you pass up with a little bit more dynamics. We look at two weeks and four weeks. These individuals actually do very well on average at two weeks. But what seems to set them apart, I know it's small sample size, but it's interesting, I think, and suggestive, is that their response is precarious. And for me, that speaks to a certain complexity in this group where the model needs to adapt. You know, this isn't, it's never arguably a one and done kind of model, but where you have personality complexity, and if people are going to do trials here, and I, I wouldn't want to dissuade them from doing that at all, but they think about adapting the model in order to accommodate uh, such, such cases. That precarious um, response is, is a thing, I think. That's a hypothesis uh, in that particular population. This is just a little, in a sense, initial warning um, about looking at cross-sectional data, you know, snapshot data. So much of data in psychiatry is of that nature. Here we're actually looking at two different domains of schizotypy. Uh, we have delusional thinking uh, on the right and then magical ideation on the left. And we're looking at prevalence of psychedelic use in a pretty big sample, uh, I think 650 people. Um, and it looks as though the more psychedelics you take, the more you dial up in schizotypy. That's how it would look if you looked at the cross-sectional data. But because we do prospective surveying, we get more of a picture of causality. So here we're looking at two weeks and four weeks post, same measures, and what we see actually in novice, so close to naive, it's less than five prior psychedelic uses, uh, naive individuals, is that they actually drop in, in this trait, uh, or phenotype if you want. So drops in, in sort of schizotypal presentation, magical thinking, and so on. So that's another tip, you know, to your prospective uh, approach. This slide is about HPPD, another spectre, as I call it, this and psychosis, arguably the spectres that hang over psychedelics. Should they? Well, psychosis has hung over in a sort of historical way, and HPPD, there's a question mark about its prevalence and so on. So in our surveying, uh, this was, let's see now, I I think the initial study was our first cohort study, so that's the 650 people. And prevalence was pretty high, actually, for identifying one of nine different domains of HBPD in relation to psychedelic use four weeks after the use. Again, the prospective approach allows you to do that kind of thing. So pretty high, and then things like positive after images and intensify colors in there. However, however, <laughs> if you look at... Uh, at uh, whether people are distressed by these symptoms, it was only two of the sample. That's 0.01%. So such a key qualifier. Yes, the prevalence is high of some residual perceptual changes, but of course it, it vitally matters whether they're distressing for the individual. Then we looked at predictors, and we found a few things. We found female gender, uh, younger age, um, polydrug use with the psychedelic, high trait absorption, which is sort of in the domain of, well, the ability to be immersed in things, to be sensitive to things, uh, and a um, non-retreat setting were predictors of having, uh, developing HPPD symptoms. So actually retreat settings were sort of protective in this sense. That makes me wonder about substance, actually. In an earlier survey that I do put at the bottom, bottom right, we actually saw suggestions this is over 10 years ago, ago now, of um, higher prevalence with LSD than, than um, psilocybin. So retreats typically are, you know, psychedelic plant medicines. Um, so I wonder whether there is a substance-specific uh, effect here. Age, we did a, a, an interesting, I think it was interesting, analysis uh, approach of splitting the sample into a broadly defined category of adolescents, 16 to 24 in our sample. Um, and then we looked at uh, different parameters. If you look at generic mental health, they actually do very well. They improve, as do adults. And so that's obviously very important in terms of, say, prophylactic intervention, preventative inter intervention for mental health. However, if you look at some risk factors like HBPD, we actually saw a higher prevalence um, in, in the young 
population there. So these are all things that, of course, we've got to be sensible and think about. I think this is my last slide now. I've been quite rapid, but uh, that's good. Um, intentionally so, to try and get it all in. It's just to circle back, really, to, yes, you know, set, setting a matrix, but what does it really mean? Has it actually been studied that well? No. <laughs> uh, are there ways to study it? Absolutely. Um, and uh, our modeling, I would say, I've probably presented to you, uh, well, a very small proportion of the work that we've done on modeling prediction of response. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, Joe Peel here led on developing a new scale. We call it the psychological integration scale. It's a scale done after a psychedelic experience. There's another scale that refers to insight during the experience itself. itself. This is more about a kind of, you know, afterglow type um, uh, insight or even longer psychological insights, personal insights that ar arise around, say, you know, why perhaps mental health issues have arisen, certain you know, perspectives on relationships and so on, so personal psychological insight. But we found that it was a significant, strong and significant mediator of improvements in a generic index of mental health well-being. Um, we've also found, and I think this is important, there's a lot of emphasis is placed on mystical, mystical type experiences, arguably with some good reason, but um, another measure that we developed, emotional breakthrough, um, we find actually to be a stronger predictor across studies now of therapeutic response. Um, I just think that's worth uh, three minutes bearing in mind because, um, you know, it's, it's a tough construct, mystical type experience. And I just wonder whether, you know, the emotional catharsis, the emotional release that can happen with psychedelic therapy is a, is a core domain to also measure and um, take into consideration. How can we promote these emotional catharsis en route to improve mental health? There's Roberta and another model on the right looking at therapeutic alliance, um, uh, passing through rapport that was actually measured on the day, I think before or the morning before the sessions. So a closer temporal proximity to the dosing uh, itself. And actually, it was that rapport. That's, it was a single item, visual analog scale uh, rating, was, was um, predictive of that all-important emotional breakthrough, the emotional catharsis en route to improvements in depre depressive symptomatology. All I would say is that there's much more where this came from. I'd love to contribute in some way to the opportunity in Oregon. Um, if it's only just consulting on measures, ideas, and what we've seen already in our data for predicting response. Um, we've got a new integration measure that we're collecting data on at the moment. And so, um, yeah, that's the call to action, is to better model response, risk, and benefits so that we can mitigate risk and ideally promote benefits. So thank you to the team and for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that really important work as to how it can apply here and beyond. So looking forward to talking more about that in the Q&A. And before I invite our next panelists to the stage, um, I wanted to let everyone know that the question app is working again, if you didn't already know. So if you have questions for our panelists now, as well as for the end of the day, um, bigger panel, please enter those into the app. And so our next panelists, we have Dr. Adie Ray Wilson-Poe, who is a neuroscientist, harm reductionist, and public servant. She's known for her extensive expertise on cannabis and digital health technologies. Her human and preclinical research is focused on pain management, addiction, and harm reduction. She's passionate about evidence-based policy and considers the exploration of one's consciousness to be a fundamental human right. Adie has been consistently funded by the NIH and has published in top academic journals under the surname Wilson Poe. And joining her on the stage is Dr. Jason Luoma, Jason Luoma is the CEO of Portland Psychotherapy Clinic in Portland. 
His research focuses on shame, self-stigma, connection, self-transcendence, and the application of acceptance and commitment therapy and psychedelic-assisted therapy. He's currently the principal investigator on a clinical trial of MDMA-assisted therapy for social anxiety disorder and has published several papers relating to psychedelics. He's an internationally recognized trainer in ACT, former chair of the ACT Training Committee, and past president of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. Welcome, Dr. Adi Ray Wilson Poe and Jason Loma. The whole world is watching us here in Oregon. This is a once in a generation opportunity to create a successful model for how to safely and effectively administer psilocybin services. Now this Measure 109 implementation that we're just getting started, we all want that to be successful. But how will we know if it's successful? And how will we convince others, assuming it does work well? Dr. Carhart Harris, he just pointed out the risks that are part of this implementation. Well, transparency is going to be critical in this. And transparency serves everyone. We all play a part in this. Transparency shows the federal government, OHA, and most importantly, people all around the world, how exactly how safe and effective these services can be. This also includes the Oregon counties that are taking this up for a vote. So it's up to us in this community, us who are going to be carrying forward Measure 109, to hold ourselves accountable. And we can do this through each making a contribution in our own way to evaluating whether the services that we provide are safe, are effective, and are delivered in a way that creates access. One of the promises of Measure 109 was that it would create better access, that it would reach more of the marginalized populations than a kind of more you know, mainstream medical approach. So we all want Me Measure 109 to be success, but ensuring success means collecting information about whether it's successful. And the only way we're going to do that is if we all contribute. Now, the Measure 109 framework shows states, like other states who might want to adopt this, how to do it. It has regulations for licensing and training. It has regulations for production, testing, and tracking. But it's really going to be up to us, the, the people who are implementing this, the community, to show other states why they should adopt this model. And that's going to happen through systematic and comprehensive collection of data and information about how it's going for providers and what the experiences are like for clients. So this is going to be key to evaluating the success of this measure, to uh, improving the quality of the services that we provide, all of these things. So this is where OPEN comes in. We're here to empower the people, this Measure 109 community that is going to be implementing this, to show that we can make this a success. Well, what is, in, what is open? It's an information gathering platform, in short. So it's hosted by OHSU. It's secure. It's nonprofit. It's voluntary. When I say voluntary, no service center, no facilitator, no client will be coerced to be a part of OPEN. It's all about inviting people as a community to contribute to something that allows us to evaluate the success of this measure and its implementation. Our aims were, are to, uh, we, want to, we want to include stakeholders. So we are reaching out to stakeholders to be involved and to guide the implementation of this system, of this, this group, um, as we go along 
uh, over the, the next few years. We want to make anonymous data collection and data collection tools available to, to everyone. So the idea here is this is open source. We're giving away this stuff. We're not pr being proprietary or patenting anything. And in the big picture, our goal really is to facilitate healing and psychological liberty for everyone around the world, and especially historically marginalized people. And just to be clear, what we're not is we are not for profit. We're not a data marketplace. None of the data that becomes part of open will ever be sold to pharma companies or for-profit enterprises. This is for the people. So here's the current steering committee. We'll soon have a larger group of, of uh, steering committee to uh, stakeholder steering committee to also be a part of this. Um, and I'm on here, but also is Adi who's going to take it through the rest of the talk. So you've heard a bit from Christopher and Alyssa quite a bit today. Um, the one person you haven't heard from today is Todd Quirthus, who's on the psilocybin advisory board. Um, and you know, between all of us, there's a wide depth of expertise from addiction medicine, public health, mental health, clinical trials with Schedule One substances. Um, and we're really grateful for the institutional resources that we also have to leverage, right? We have access to IRBs, we have access to encrypted firewalls. Um, so we're really grateful for those resources because they're going to be critical in helping us achieve our goals. And really those goals are fourfold. Um, you know, those five faces that you see are just the tip of the spear when it comes to the team that comprises OPEN. Um, because the team really is the entire Measure 109 community. It is all of our service centers, it is all of our facilitators, all of our clients who are voluntarily providing information to um, contribute to con uh, transparency and success. Um, as a steering committee, it's really our responsibility to provide this community with those tools to demonstrate success. And so the first tool, of course, is you know, how we go about um, collecting that data, how we provide that um, platform to you. And it's our intention to build this platform from scratch so that it is easy to use, that there is no barrier to using it, there is no barrier to participation in OPEN's network. Um, we've made a lot of progress on creating a novel measure to, to actually validate the success of the program. We've just completed um, a big round of interviews, in-depth interviews, with more than two dozen psilocybin experts. And when I say experts, I mean everyone from people who have conducted clinical trials to people who are peer support specialists on you know, indigenous wisdom keepers and lots of folks in between. So using those precision tools that we're developing, those new measures, we'll um, you know, disseminate those measures over our user-friendly website, and we'll be able to collect information about what clients are experiencing in Oregon. And the whole point of collecting that information is this public transparency effort, right? So um, very much similar to the way that the OHA visualizes all of our COVID-19 information on a daily basis, the same way that the OHA visualizes opioid overdoses, you know, broken down by county. That's exactly what we envision in terms of a real, you know, real-time data transparency effort um, to demonstrate to the rest of the world, to our own citizens, to our regulators, this is how well we can do. Um, finally, you know, our last aim is to really look at this network as a hub for research, right? This, this research network is a huge opportunity to attract additional grant funding. It's a huge opportunity to do both retrospective and prospective research, as Dr. Carhart Harris has emphasized. Um, and it's also, you know, a, a really important place where we can uh, coordinate multi-site clinical trials. So, you know, we really do see open. This network is the incubator of all of these future research efforts. Um, but in order to um, achieve these aims, there's, you know, some very clear needs that we have. Um, the first one is probably obvious, which is funding. You know, thus far we've been begging, borrowing, and stealing from our departments and turning up the couch cushions. 
Um, but we have had some really encouraging conversations with potential donors. Um, we've also had some very encouraging conversations with SAMHSA about uh, potentially bringing in some federal funding to support this effort. Um, and those efforts are ongoing. And the wonderful thing is that we do have the OHSU Foundation that is able to manage any philanthropic giving that comes our way to support this effort. Um, another really deep need of ours is community oversight. It is incredibly important to us that we remain true to the intent of Measure 109, the reason that it was passed, that we support the voters and, and what they wanted to see in, in the execution of this measure. And that requires remaining rooted in the community, right? We need a diverse panel of stakeholders to help us make sure that we are doing everything that we can to support this community in transparency and accountability. Um, I think probably one of the most important things that we need is we need a network, right? The open is only a network if we have people who are actually contributing to the, the database. Um, and we've, we do think that there are some really powerful reasons that our facilitators and our service centers would consider joining this network. You know, um, the first one, you know, Jason has touched on already, which is simply the opportunity to demonstrate to the world, this is exactly how successful we can be, right? And the more people we have that are contributing to this data set, the more powerful those results are, right? Um, a rich data set makes it very easy to demonstrate success. Um, we also have been having really promising discussions with NPA about uh, reciprocal membership benefits. And what I mean by that is that members in the open community would also be eligible to have either reduced insurance premiums or reduced membership dues in NPA. Um, so we're really excited to continue those conversations and flesh out those details so that we can have those reciprocal benefits. Um, we also think that there are some just nitty-gritty business you know, opportunities when it comes to you know, collaborating with Open. Um, one of which is it's our intent to build a personalized dashboard for every facilitator. So this is really your own internal ability to do QA, right? It is a summary of all client feedback that allows you to see how you're doing and see how you can be improving your services. Um, finally, we're really excited to you know, have discussions with the OHA to make it easy for any information that comes in to open, we'd like to be able to synthesize it and easily export it so that it can be used to fulfill annual reporting requirements. So, you know, with that, I think that we have, um, at least I hope that we have, you know, demonstrated that everyone plays a role in this process to some degree, whether it's through community oversight, donation, um, or simply membership in the network itself. Um, please reach out to Jason or myself, get a hold of the rest of the team. We're very interested in having additional conversations to make sure that this whole effort, the entire Measure 109 community can be successful and demonstrate it to the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Adi and Jason. We now have about 10 minutes for some Q&A for our panelists. I'm going to start by asking a couple questions. Um, Robin, first, I'm curious. So you described this you know, predictive modeling and how important it is to have that modeling in order to determine you know, who may have worse outcomes and how we can track that and predict these things from happening at large scale. I'm curious if you have initial thoughts on how this could apply to the Oregon model, um, given that we don't have you know, mandated data reporting, how might this be implemented? Yeah, first, I think that's a shame. I mean, if there was one take home at the end of my talk uh, that I should have made clearer, it would have been, please collect data. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so important. It's only really through that that we, we learn in, in anything like a scientific way. Um, and so it's just going to be such a missed opportunity. And if you really believe in this, then again, you've got to collect the data because how are you going to demonstrate it if you don't have the data to demonstrate safety and efficacy? Mm -hmm. So I actually say it would have been better had it been mandated. I just would just encourage people involved to um, think about the value of data and, and what it can do. Um, and 
Yeah, we've got some ideas at the moment, some assumptions, but they need to be tested. That's what they are, they're assumptions, and that's why we do science. So unless we can collect data, we can't really test our ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And along those lines, uh, Jason, 80, I'm curious if um, there are steps that Open will take to protect privacy. I know that this is kind of the issue a lot of the times that comes up when we talk about data collection is how are we protecting privacy given that we are engaging with folks who are um, you know, doing something that's federally illegal and so there's hesitation around giving data and how will Open protect privacy? Okay. Well, we haven't worked out the exact details of the, the exact methods, but there are ways that you can collect data on samples, on populations that is anonymous, and um, by just how you organize the data collection, you know, not collecting identifiers that will reveal their identities, and so it's, it's not too hard to anonymize data and make sure that people's uh, private information isn't included in it. Um, and then I think one of the trickier parts is actually having something that can match a person over time so that if they fill out, a for, fill out some sort of assessment at one time point, how do you have them matched up at a second time point? But there are ways even to deal with that that are anonymous by having them do things like generate custom personal codes and things that allows it to be anonymous. So I think collecting anonymized data is, is really not, not difficult. It just means you have to avoid certain kinds of data. You can't have their names. You can't have their social security number. You can't have their address. And we just wouldn't collect that information. And I, I think, too, that this is not an area where we have to completely invent the wheel, right? There are yeah. lots of publicly available, you know, databases, visualizations of big sets of data where you cannot, in, you know, no individual could trace back any of those data points to the people who generated them. Um, this is why we're really grateful to be working with the OHSU IT team who, you know, routinely builds all kinds of uh, research projects and visualizes all kinds of, you know, very sensitive health data. Um, you know, so this is, this is not an area that we're concerned about. However, I would say that the concern from the community in terms of, you know, um, you know wanting to be really careful about um, confidentiality and anonymity, of course, those concerns are valid and we're with you there. Um, you know, we see a very similar thing with the cannabis world, which is where, you know, my, my work has focused for most of my career. Um, and it's the same thing. There are huge patient registries where, you know, these patients are using a Schedule One substance. Um, and those registries have been incredibly useful and powerful in terms of healthcare providers and researchers being able to understand what's working, who's responding well, how can we improve our clinical care, and that's the exact same model that we'd like to port over in, in this you know, paradigm is to protect people's privacy, treat data with dignity, um, but still be able to learn some very valuable lessons, close health parity, and, and provide great services. Great, thank you. Another data question specific to open, but I think could also apply uh, for Robin as well. Um, folks are wondering what data will be used or should be used to demonstrate success or failure of Measure 109. Yeah, I, I think that it's important that we ask the experts to tell us, right, what does success look like? And some of those experts include the clients themselves, you know, um, as was said earlier today, it was a, a really great piece of wisdom that when the client tells you they're better, they're better. Um, so that's, that's really important. We're looking to the experts, um, you know, a wide range of experts to tell us what does success look like? What does safety look like? What is effectiveness? You know, if we're trying to offer equitable services, what does that really mean? So we don't, you know, presume to have those answers. We definitely are looking to the experts to help us develop those measures. Um, and this is uncharted territory, which is exactly why we're going through this, you know, IRB-approved research process um, to, you know, deeply um, engage with these experts to figure out these questions that no one has asked before. Thank you. Can I, can I have one thing about that? Yes, of course. I guess I, I, another thing is there's, there's often a tension between um, equity, you know, uh, diversity, in, 
inclusivity kind of issues and um, marginalized communities in science and data collection. And yet I think this is one of those places where, where data collection and science can actually be very important in terms of promoting equity because if we don't actually collect the data on who's accessing the services, we won't, act, we won't know whether this was implemented in a way that was equitable and increased access. And so we're hoping that we can really put a push behind that of you know, real accountability and knowing really who's accessing these services and open can help with that. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of the oh, am I on? <laughs> one of the challenges with data collection of this nature is uh, that it's attrition and the fact that especially if people are coming in for a service, they don't necessarily want to do it, you know? <laughs> That's probably why it was sort of, you know, not, not mandated, oh, we don't want the hassle, like uh, carer and patient, so to speak, or, um, you know, receiver of treatment it, don't, don't want that hassle, or they think it's invasive. And, but you simplify that by, first of all, you know, looking at how the measures have evolved and how, how mental health measures have evolved, for example, is actually, generally speaking, towards a simplification, mm -hmm. they become more efficient to such an extent now that there's a strong move towards measuring generic mental health. It doesn't necessarily need to be chopped up into however many dimensions are in the mm -hmm. current DSM, you know, um, but at least to have, say, the WHO 5, World Health Organization, five items, how long does it take you to do that? Nothing, but, you know, you could, you could have everyone do that before and after. And that would be really valuable data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A couple more. Would open only be available to licensed practitioners? Is there any interest in collecting data from the underground community? I don't, I don't know that that's something that we've explicitly talked about before. I know that, you know, there are already some really wonderful platforms out there, Quantified Citizen and uh, the Microdose um, digital health technology that we saw earlier. I don't know that we would preclude that. Um, I think that the, the benefit of using licensed facilitators and practitioners is, you know, we'll potentially have a little bit more information in terms of the product that was used, the dose that was administered, the sort of, we'll have a richer data set in terms of, um, you know, its fidelity. Um, yeah, what do you think, Jason? That's a great question, yeah. I, I guess what I, I do imagine is that the, the website and the, the app will be highly specific to Measure 109 and the implementation, and so I can imagine that it we would have to create a whole other system to cl capture that data probably. So mm. I don't know if that's likely to happen, but that would be, that's a really fascinating idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it absolutely is. I mean, there's an opportunity because if you do that, then you m can make a comparison. Mm. And if you harmonize uh, between the initiatives and have the same measures in each, yeah. then you can show that the initiative is good, it's mm -hmm, safer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's working well. If that is your assumption, you can test that assumption. Yeah, so actually, it's, it's really important yeah. to try and do that, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. That's the end of our panel Q&A.